Uh, welcome to the Artist Talk series. This is the second artist in a series of six artists for fall and winter. So we have uh, four more, one more for this semester. Um, there's some brochures on your seats with the full calendar. Uh, there's also surveys on your seats. So if you have time at the end of the talk, fill that out for us. Uh, the funding for this series comes from Student Life, from the FEP grant. And so the surveys help with the grant as well. Our speaker tonight is Jacques de Beaufort. He earned his MFA from the prestigious California Institute of the Arts. He moved from California to accept a position as associate professor at Palm Beach State College. He's both a visual artist and filmmaker with a studio in Lake Worth. De Beaufort has exhibited extensively in South Florida, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and London. His first feature-length film, Sanctum and Sacrum, received substantial critical support, and his debut music video for the band In Heaven was premiered by Spin Magazine in 2013. Most recently, De Beaufort launched Unit One Exhibitions, a project space in Lake Worth, Florida, and founded Unit One Media, a film and video production studio housed in the same location. Over the last de decade, Jacques has worked steadily towards the construction of a unique and visionary surrealist cosmology. As he explains in his artist statement, I paint because there is not enough magic in this world. I believe that the art object is embedded with its own meaning and that certain works create an aura of experience that defies language or reproduction. Certain ideas and images are timeless. My intent is to work in the contemporary space, to always be reaching out for a realm that exists outside of now, but simultaneous with both the past and the present. So please join me in welcoming Jacques de Beaufort. You make it sound so fancy, thank you. Um, just notice that balloon right there. Wonder if there's a story there. Um, were we gonna do the light, the, yeah. Well, thanks for coming, and, and it's r really, you know, sometimes it's weird, like, um, it's almost like a, a disembodied experience when you talk about your own work, especially when you have this microphone that all of a sudden is making me feel like uh, I'm in a movie about my life or something like that. But anyways, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. It's very great. Um, and... Uh, I guess this is the part where I just kind of show you some stuff and talk about it and introduce myself. Um, so like Lisa said, my name is Jacques de Beaufort. Um, here I am as a little kid. And um, I think what I, what I would want to do at this point is just give you some background to, um, to understand where I'm coming from. How did, how did this little guy end up as that maniac? Um, I don't know. Um, Part of the story probably is that I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, uh, everybody asks me if I'm French or not. I'm, I'm American. I'm not French. My father was part Dutch, uh, part American. His parents were actually um, diplomats from the uh, Netherlands. Um, and he worked at the Red Cross in Washington, D.C., which is sort of where I, the area that I grew up, and it's where I was exposed to um, these great paintings at the National Gallery and a lot of other galleries there. Has anybody been to the DC area before? Um, that's one of the things that I really loved growing up is that they had such a, you know, the artwork in the museums were amazing. And I think if, if I had grown up in any other place, and I think it helped too probably that my dad was, um, he had majored in, or minored in art history, so we had a lot of books around. Um, my interest might have gone into a different way. I think the early experiences that you, that you have um, can really spark something inside you. That's, you know, that's why it's great that, you know, you have an art department at this school or, you know, or maybe you didn't at your high school, I don't know. But um, I certainly was lucky and that the message that was sent to me was that making paintings or making art was something that, w that you, sh you could do, that it was cool to do, that, you know, it was po there's a possibility there. And, um, and that if you did that, it would be, you know, it would be displayed hopefully at some point and there was, you know, there's a there's a point to it all, um, and um, yeah, a lot of and so recently going back and visiting some of those museums was really fun, and just you know remembering kind of why I love them so much. And you know the great thing about the National Gallery in D.C. is that um, if I don't know if you study art history, but a lot of very very famous works that actually will be in your art history book 
are there at the National Gallery. Um, works by people like Titian or, or whoever. Um, and I think this, this got me into, as a, as a young kid, I was really, you know, I would really nerd out on this stuff. And, and so part of really, you know, explaining where I am now or how I got there is um, giving a, like a sense of what, when I was younger, what I was really interested in. Um, I remember we had a book on Hieronymus Bosch, who's this really far out Netherlandish uh, painter. Is anybody familiar with his work at all? You should check him out. Um, as a kid, I just loved this stuff. I thought it was totally crazy and weird. I mean, it, I still think it's totally crazy and weird. Um, and really, you know, without knowing anything about his work, I was just drawn to it, the weird, the strangeness of it, the darkness of it. Um, but also there was a, a, a beauty in it. Also people like Tintoretto. And a lot, the, a lot of this stuff, it's not like it was a, you know, eight-year-old kid who was looking at, you know, Tintoretto or something like that. It was just images. What I'm showing you now are images that um, represent artists that have excited me and inspired me over time, not just as a, as a kid. Um, Tintoretto is a Venetian artist. I always loved how uh, strange and dramatic his work has. It has this very phantasmagoric feel to it. Um, not all of it does. One of his most favorite, famous paintings is uh, his version of The Last Supper. You might have seen, it's possible that you might have seen that. El Greco, I think, is a, a real interesting painter um, as well. I teach art history, too. And so for me, a lot, of, um, a lot of this stuff is in my mind. A lot of people, I think, with art history, it's, it's like they read it in their class and put it on a shelf. and they put it, It's in a book. It's on a, a shelf. And I don't think about it too much. Um, but I'm always thinking about this stuff. Like for me, it's very real, and I like, I like, you know, referring to that type of work, and making it real by, you know, I'm obviously probably not as good as these guys, but um, I feel like I'm working in their tradition in some way. Um, Jean Auguste Dominique Ang was a really interesting painter. He's not really like a romantic painter or a neoclassical painter. He's kind of hard to uh, classify. This is a really, one of the most interesting things about this painting is that he was 83, I think, when he painted it. <laughs> so I don't know what that tells you, but it's a, sort of like a keyhole image of, um, well, a harem, a seraglio, we would call him. Um, I, if I've gone to these art history lessons, this lecture will last two, you know, last two hours. Uh, people like Delacroix from the Romantic movement, um, this is the kind of explosive, exciting stuff that really appealed to me. Not like the, you know, the still lifes or whatever. The stuff that had all, you know, the, the, the good stuff in it, I guess, you know, and um, whatever that means. Henry Fuseli is a, was a Swiss painter that I really admire. Um, his work, a lot of times he's telling stories that come from uh, Shakespeare. He, he did a work called The Nightmare that you might have seen. It's really uh, amazing. Richard Dan is a less known artist. Um, and uh, he's famous for killing his, his dad and then spending the rest of his life being locked up in a mental institution. Bedlam, actually, was the name of it, um, where he would spend up to four or five years on each individual painting, uh, which I think is just fantastic that he, you know, I'm sorry that he killed his dad which, and everything and went insane, but what we got out of that were just these amazingly detailed works that you have to look at with the electron microscope practically to kind of see what's going on. And the intensity of that is really exciting. Somebody like Gustave Moreau as well, who's sort of a late, um, I don't know what you'd call, he's a symbolist painter, you know that movement. And so he's a late academic painter. He's painting right as modernity is beginning to rear its modern head and photography had been invented. So he's, he's persisting, I think, in this tradition. Um, Moving down through the years, people like Edward Monk, who's more famous for the scream, but I like his version of the Madonna. It's not clear whether she's having some kind of orgasm here, which is maybe the, where the controversy is coming from. Um, or um, surrealism. It's funny because like I, the, the billing here was for me as a surrealist painter, but I don't really know that I'm anything. I mean, I have so many, um, so many people that, that I really enjoy. And surrealist, surrealism is, is one of these sources and probably the most coherent movement. Um, if you don't know Max Ernst, you probably know Salvador Dali. And these are artists that were really thinking about imagery with the benefit of 
um, coming after or coming on the scene at the time when something called psychology, you, everybody knows what psychology, but thinkers like Freud and Carl Jung were really um, laying down the, the, you know, the, bed, the basis for exploring this notion of the subconscious or dream imagery um, and developing theories about that, archetypes. Um, a lesser known painter who's kind of like a magical realist, I guess you could call him, Ernst Fuchs. He's still alive today, actually. I'm really amazed that he's not more famous um, uh, than he is. It's sort of astounding. Um, that's another work by his. I mean, it's, he did this stuff in like the 50s, and it looks like it was done you know, at Burning Man last year or something like that. It has this crazy quality to it. I always loved the Hindu art. I don't even know the artist here, but I just love these images of Shiva, and I think this is Vishnu or something like that. And they always had this psychedelic quality. Frank Frazetta. Uh, is also somebody that I love. Um, he was sort of much maligned as like a cheesy fantasy illustrator, but I really liked him. So those are a lot of the painters that I've, from the past, that I've really admired. There are a lot of painters from the present that I really admire. I don't really have time to go into them because it would just be about Jacques de Beaufort, pain, painters I admire for the entire hour, so I don't think we could do that. So back to, you know, the origins. Um, when I went away to college, this is me, in a shop window. Um, the, the thing that you do when you become an artist is I think one of the first things that you realize is that like you want to say something. I've got something to say. And then is a long and arduous process of working backwards from that point of, of certainty to well, what the heck is it that I'm going to say? And that could take an entire lifetime. But at this point I knew that I, I wanted to be an artist, you know, and I wanted to put myself out there. I think if you're a little shy or ambitious, I think that, or not, not ambitious, well, you have to be ambitious, but if you're a little shy and hold back too much, I think that might be a hazard for an artist. I think an artist really is a person that has to be, I don't, there's many narcissistic and overbearing artists, but there needs to be a little bit of you that isn't afraid to get up and say, hey, this is my work. Um, so why I'm uh, in, in a shop window, it was just, I had put on this festival and as a like prank to uh, promote it, um, and this is so many years ago, I lived in this um, shop window for like, uh, like four days as like a prank to kind of like raise um, awareness of it, I guess. So the point of that is that um, part of being an artist is putting yourself out there, and, and I think that's a lot of the early my early themes uh, were kind of self-referential in a lot of ways. So from uh, the University of Virginia, I traveled west to California. And this is a great view from one of my studios of downtown Los Angeles. Um, I think there had been a fire somewhere off in the distance, which is why it's that beautiful orange color. That's all smoke in the air. And this is on a big hill called Figueroa Terrace overlooking the city. Um, and it was a really big, you know, it was a really big change. It was something that was crazy to kind of go into from, from one area in the East uh, Coast to go into this enormous, you know, in Los Angeles, I think there's like 25 million people in the greater uh, metropolitan area. There was a, there's a possibility in places like Los Angeles and in New York to, to a lesser extent in uh, Miami to actually really make a lot of money off of artwork, there's a market there. There's people that buy work, um, and a lot of a lot of my friends and myself for a while did that. Um, it's very hard to do that at a place here. Um, you can do it in Miami, certainly, but it's more of a struggle. But I think it's still a struggle too if you end up in those places. And so I don't necessarily advise anybody just do that on a whim. Um, after I went to Cal Arts, I moved into uh, Chinatown and. Uh, so here's some pictures of, of like an early studio that I had in Chinatown. Um, a couple of friends and I converted what had been like a mahjong parlor. I don't know if anybody knows what that was. Um, into our studio, we had like this warren of studios. And on one side was our studios, and the other side was a bar uh, called Hop Louie. And um, it was kind of like, it was like the year 2000. I think this is before the real estate crash and everything. And um, the whole area had really nothing in it except a lot of storefront windows that 
a lot of enterprising artists kind of said, hey, we could do a we could put a gallery in here, we could put our studio in here. And from us sort of coming in, and I don't want to say I'm responsible for it, but there was a group of people that came in, all of Chinatown became this enormous art community. Until when I left, I think there was like something like 50 galleries where there had just been like three. So um, it was really cool to be part of that. It's, it's really funny looking back at these images. Um, it's a little bit surreal. Um, now, but the early stuff I did, and there's me, a younger me, um, I, I would take like, because it came out of CalArts where, CalArts is, is a school where the, the conceptual piece of the work was very important. And I think the more and more like a distance I have from CalArts, the less and less I feel that I need to do that. Um, not that I'm like against it, but um, it's, really, it's really true that when you're young, where you're, you're, you're much more easy to, you're more impressionable, let's just say. And um, so I think as I've, I've gotten away from my education, I've become more the artist that I am. Um, so although it's great to say that I went to this school or that school, I don't think that that's a definitive thing. Um, so why am I in this weird pose here? Well, I would take these photos, and then um, in Photoshop, I would kind of take, uh, take all the photos and put them together. And I don't know if you can see, there's kind of like figure. Can you see figures in this? So they're kind of like landscapes made out of me, you know, in a way. And, and so uh, in, a, in a sense, it's like it's an internal landscape that's populated by my body, and I'm trying to, like, turn it into um, something else. So the source material was interesting um, to me. And I had a little success, some success with these works, and they sold. I don't know why I changed my style. I just, I should have just kept doing this. <laughs> it would probably have made a lot of money. Um, but it was fun to do. It was fun to kind of play around with color and, uh, and just be wacky and weird. And um, at this point, too, I'd started teaching um, at various colleges. Um, and in Los Angeles, there's, I, I think I've taught at like nine colleges total, including the school that I work at now. And there's so many colleges in Los Angeles. So you can just drive from one. You can teach at one and then drive to the other and teach and then drive to the other. And so doing that, I kind of cobbled together a living. Now, in California, they pay college professors like probably double what Florida does. Um, so I look at the adjuncts here, and I'm like, man, how can you guys even do that? So in between making money from doing that, which sometimes it would only have to work a couple days a week, and then starting to make money from the paintings, it was able to survive. Um, and when you're young, when you're in your 20s or early 20s, you don't really need a lot. You know, you don't need like all this fancy stuff. Um, and, and so it's great to just live on the edge and kind of be, you know, that starving artist. I mean, there's nothing starving about it because your experience is so rich. I mean, you're living in this kind of like fantasy world, I guess you could call it. Um, I'm holding a cat in here, too, in the upper left. I had lots of, my girlfriend at the time had kept bringing cats in. So I ended up with a whole bunch. Um, and this might be like. The last one. So I did this series for a while, and I think you know I felt like it had reached its logical conclusion. I broke up with said girlfriend, and a lot of other you know things happened. And one of the themes that I hopefully can communicate tonight is that um, for me, what, one of the most fun things about being an artist is always sort of going from one phase of work to the other, and they're not complete um, disembarkations. Like there's always a holdover of an idea, so it transforms into something else. But in this case, the subject matter just became too boring. It was just like landscapes out of me. It's like, how many times can that be interesting? So I started to put me then in other landscapes that, other, that had all kinds of stuff in it. And um, I guess maybe because I, because I wasn't sure that, that you know, like, if the work was going to be seen as being too illustration-y. And that's always like in the fine art world, that's always when you do work like mine that is very rendered and um, takes a lot of technical skill. There's this strange backlash against it. Like, it's, oh, there's no ideas there. It's just illustration. And um, this probably seems weird to, to hear that, but I, uh, Scott's honor, it's true. Um, so I just started populating the work with all kinds of strange stuff. And my, my thing here was I didn't really, I didn't want it to be like overthought. I didn't want to be like, well, I'm going to put a dinosaur head in because it represents something about X, Y, I was like, no, I'm just going to put a dinosaur head because I feel like it, you know, because I want to. 
you know, or some cat, or I'm going to do, you know, a, a cave where I'm going to be evil versions of me, or be, and is there a reason why? Um, and I said, well, I don't really need to have a reason, really. It's like, it's just because I wanted to make the, the, the painting, the image. And um, that was good enough, you know? Um, so the, what are they about? You know, what are, what's any of the work uh, about? And I think, you know, it's hard to answer that question. And I can tell you what I'm interested in. You know, I can tell you the themes and ideas that, I like, that I'm exploring, but ultimately the, the work itself kind of generates its own meaning. And any, any, an artist that wants to kind of like take their work and say, well, this is how you have to receive it, I don't agree with that. Um, some people find that really annoying. I don't know if you know the filmmaker David Lynch, but he's, he did a lot of great movies, and he's famous for like not saying anything about his work, and his work is oftentimes like these very obscure riddles. And people get mad, and they're like, well, why don't you just explain your movies? And he's like, you know what? I made the movie. It's there. It'd be kind of an insult to your experience as a viewer to, to over-determine it. And I, and I really believe that great work has a kind of... Um, well, the fancy word is hermeneutics, but like say The Shining, for example, which is this great film by Kubrick. And there's a film made about that film called Room 237. Has anybody seen that movie? Now, one of the things about The Shining that's so great is that there's so many different ways to interpret it. And that's why there's a freaking movie made about a movie. You know, if it was, an, it was a cut and dry movie, oh, well, you know, the, the butler did it or whatever that had a meaning that wasn't um, open to interpretation, it would quickly be consumed and then forgotten about. But The Shining itself and our other great works of art, I think really kind of resist, resist that. And, but there's an experience that they create. So maybe what I'm trying to say is that with the paintings, like if somebody were to ask me, well, why did you make a painting of like these weird hominid creatures walking in the or to paint, like I don't really have a good answer for that question. You know, it just kind of came to me that that would be something cool to do. And, and maybe like it's that, the, the, the thing about creating a landscape that's full of these things that are cool, that when you're an artist, when I try and create, I just want the thing to come forward. Like, and if it's not coming forward, then you just can't do it. Like it has to kind of, almost create itself. I don't want to sound like some spooky, like, it's a, like I'm a medium for a spirit entity or something like that. But I think the creative process has its own logic. And for me, that's part of the logic is that it doesn't, it isn't logical, you know? That it's based on experiences and ideas and images, all these, Im the soup of images that we're all familiar with. And I guess maybe we'd call that um, an archetype. That'd be a fancy word for it. Um, uh, this was back when they had that anthrax scare. And I don't know if anybody remembers that after 2011 or 2001. I just thought those were kind of creepy looking dudes. And um, I was like, you know, I'll throw that in a, a, a painting with, with all this other stuff. And, and kind of it's, it's just resonating with its own kind of thing. Um, why is that thing there? I don't know. What's he looking at? Sometimes the titles, I think, are, are like important. Sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes I kind of throw, you know, it's like your people expect a title and it's really lame to say like untitled. So it's kind of fun to come up with titles. This one, I think I called it the first time I fell in love. <laughs> and it's a volcano that has like giant wolves and some medical illustration of a dead, bot, dead, dead man. So I don't know what that means. Cool painting, I like. And then the part of the question, here's like where we get to this thing where like, well, who's gonna hang that on their wall of their couch, you know? Which is I think where a lot of people are coming from. If you're just coming to art, that's one of the, your, your big questions. Like, oh yeah, I'd, I'd take that home, put it over my couch. No, I'm not gonna take that home. And that's where you see like, the, that's your lens of how you experience work, whether it can be put on your couch or not. I'm pretty sure ain't nobody gonna be putting this over their couch, unless they're, you know, heavy metal guitar player or something like that. I don't know. But that's not why we make those images as artists. And in certain art worlds, not all of them, like people are hip to that. And they're like, yeah, well, and usually it's like, you know, pretty wealthy people who 
are part of their own world, and you may or may not ever meet these people. But they don't even, they put, they buy the painting, they put it in a warehouse, and then it just stays there in case you ever become like more famous and the work ever becomes bigger, you know, or to become, pump, become part of their personal collection. It'll get seen in a museum or a gallery or something like that. It's not made to be an interior design object. You guys know what I'm saying? Like that's not the point of the image. And that's so liberating for a painting to be able to not have to care whether it looks good over a couch because then really you're just, you're, art is sort of trivial. You know, it's like, it's just like a piece of furniture. And why would we have an hour conversation about me making furniture? I mean, maybe we, sure we could, but I don't think that's as interesting. Um, so as time got, went on, I had more, a little more success here and there. And, and then I say that, I want to say that, you know, the thing about success in art is like, you're going to go up and then you're going to go down and then you're going to go up. And, it, and so you never should ever get too cocky. You know, and time will teach you the lesson of humility. So he started out by saying, well, you got to be like a bit cocky and everything. And that's true. But then the other lesson that life will teach you as an artist is that a lot of times it's going to kick the chair out from under you. And then you're going to keep going. You're not going to keep going. Um, maybe that's the point of this image. I don't know. I, it's probably not. Um, but there's this wandering figure and this all this crazy stuff. This was a very large painting. I think it was about exactly this size, now that I look at it. It took me a long time to paint. Um, I was into mountains. I think that here we see themes starting to emerge. You know, it's like, and you'll see that more and more. So for me, I think this was like my, I was interested in mountains and like this idea of the mountain as a axis mundi. You know, it's like, it's where all this, the closest to the spiritual realm. I suppose, and so all this weird trans, trans, supernatural transmission kind of occurs in the mountaintop, like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when that big UFO comes down and takes the people with them. You know, it's just something that I think, like, we get a lot. We just get it. You know, you get it. And then the the collection of all this stuff, you know, these dead bones and the the, the archaeological accumulation. I also was like tripped out for a while by these mountain climber people that obviously they got to have, you got to have a lot of money if you're going to go and just like, oh, I'm going to go climb Mount Everest. And it's like, nah, what about your job? Well, I don't have a job. Um, they'll just go and just like climb a mountain just to, you know, to, because it's there. And many of them die and it doesn't seem like it's very fun. <laughs> Except that you get to come back and brag about it. And, um, and, and I started, th you know, but that's like, when you paint, or you make paintings that have, you have to put so many hours into, and it's like nobody may ever see it. It's, it's almost like that thing, like you're, you, you hate it as you're doing it, but then after you come down from it, you're like, oh yeah, I made that painting. You know, because all the work that I do, a lot of the work, these are smaller images, a lot of the work that I do is, is really labor intensive, and takes a long time. Um, and once again, I have no idea what any of this stuff is about. So you could ask me, and I'd just be like, well, it's about like bones and <laughs> like ancient Olmec heads. And it's about creating, I think it's about creating uh, an experience. It's about like whatever, it's about creating a mood and evoking something. And, and painting some, sometimes can do that. You know, this is before any of that, like, you know, well, it's not before or after or anything, but like, this is like, I think from 2003. And, Kind of reminds me now of all that tsunami stuff. And um, we do have kind of like this fascination with morbidity and all those images of destruction. And in, in more civilized times, we would call that idea the sublime, quote unquote. But I think there's media today is almost pornographic. It really wants to create scandals and it wants to show you the stuff that disturbs you or, you know. Um, it's not media's fault that the tsunami happened, though, or, or whatever, or this accident or that accident. But there's this quality of like um, morbid fascination, I think, that we have. I also got interested in underwater stuff, coral reefs and caves. Um, where does creativity come from? You know, all the things that are, you know, nighttime, all the things that are associated with these romantic, I, not romantic as in romance novels, but the art movement called romanticism. Um, shamans kind of really started fascinating me. 
He started as like an Aboriginal shaman. I think this is a woman from the Ifi tribe. And now people ask me at this time, they're like, well, you're like this white dude. Like, why do you think you're, you should be able to paint like an Aboriginal shaman? I was like, well, I don't know. I just wanted to. Is there, you know, problem with that, you know? And I guess, again, like, if, it's hard to describe the, the, the what, is, what this art world or LA art world or the New York art world are like because you don't, you maybe don't know like that, and I didn't know that there were like rules. And when you go to be an artist, you're like, well, I'm an artist because I don't like rules. But then when you go into this art world that has these little tre this is like trends and fashions and stuff, and they're like, no, no, it's not, it doesn't look like this and that and the other, and there's rules, you know? And I was like, well, really? There's rules? Like, okay, so I can't paint shamans or something? And um, I would encourage you to ignore all those rules because they're just gonna make crap art. And, and your art is going to be boring. So break the rules. Um, the reflection was fun to do with this one. So I think I'm getting better at this point at oil painting. It takes a while to do. Um, and as time goes on, I mean, as time goes on, if you make work, it just kind of accumulates, strangely. And um, I think here I'm still, you know, I'm still in the landscape phase, and, and each one of these things has its own deal. I think and this is the stage where they're kind of getting darker um, and more integrated, maybe more lyrical. Um, this work and the following few pieces are all were part of a, the first solo show I had in New York at Julia Friedman Gallery. Um, and so when I did them, it, would, uh, it was kind of like I wanted to make I wanted to make something that had uh, like a figure in it, but also had this oozing organic, not erotic, but something that had eros in it, which is, which is a different thing. It's more in the Freudian sense um, of, the, of the term. And some stuff like snakes, you know, interest me, or multi-armed gods. And I remember the art dealer I was working with was always trying to say like, well, what, what can I tell the collector? What is this about? Like, what does this mean? And I, and I, just going back to things I said a few minutes ago, I was just like, you know, I don't know. You can tell them whatever you want, you know. And but the thing is, people I think really want, they really want it to be determined, and it's hard for a lot of people to be left out in that space of interpretation. And I, I, I guess you know, like, so be it, you know. Um, and I've never, as an artist, I've never said to myself, well. I have to make work a certain way because it's like a good idea strategically for me to do that. They've never done that. And, um, and looking back over many years, I feel really good about that decision. Because um, I don't want to like then do this, this whole presentation and say like, well, man, that work sucks because like I just did it to like make money or something like that. And I'm happy that I don't have to say that. Um, I think this is called the hand of God. So I think you can see like the, a lot of the art historical influences coming in more. Um, and they're still really retaining a lot of the, the, narr the form. And just thinking to a few minutes ago when it was just, it was completely different colorful kind of abstract stuff, you can slowly see it starting to change and the imagery starting to change. Um, this is probably you know, it gets darker and darker. Um, they're like decapitated. I think they're all kind of like self-portraits maybe. Um, I guess all art really is kind of sense. In a sense, it's a self-portrait. In here, it's like the, the, the cave ape hominid or whatever. It's like, is it blood? Is it paint? Is, what is it? What is this stuff, you know, that he's working with that's coming out of this explosion? in the background that I lifted from a Turner, JMW Turner painting. Um, and it's just maybe when you look at your own work, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're just as clueless. You're like, well, wow, what is this stuff that I'm making? Um, this was around the time of one war or the other. I think it was the Iraq war or something like that. And maybe that was on my mind. Certainly, this, this painting is um, not going to go over grandmother's couch. <laughs> I was actually so disturbed by it that I eventually painted over it. But looking, I'm glad I took the image, because it's pretty wild. Um, 
I suppose like we have, like in my mind, I think that we have to, as artists or creators, we have to go into these dark places of humanity and expose them. I think that if we don't do that, then more bad shit happens. You know, it's part of like bringing, it's the subconscious, this, you know, everybody has the like killer instinct in them. I mean, you can, if you go to war, you're gonna be asked to kill somebody. Um, and you just have to go down the street and you can see examples of human behavior that are really not pretty. I'm not trying to say that this isn't everybody, but like we have to look at it. We have to look at it if we want to understand what the human experience is. You know, It's nice to look at pretty paintings too. And so I don't, and as we get more towards the present, you'll, you'll see a different side come out. Um, but at this point, I was really interested in going into the, the dark place. The thing I remember about this painting is it took me like 10 months to do. And I always tell my students that because they whine and complain about the charcoal drawing that did 30 minutes and I tell them to start over and like, it took 30 minutes. I'm like, dude, that's a, yo, it took 10 months to do a painting one time. And, and so then I had, uh, there was this art collector that came in, I think he was a, a film producer or something, came into my studio. And it's so funny like how like people just, they just they just don't, like, and, and he didn't have to buy it. He didn't, like, it doesn't matter. But, like, I spent 10 months on this thing. I was like, oh, my God, I finished it. And, and then this is the art dealer that I knew had brought in this collector. And I was like, oh, I hope he likes it. I hope he, I hope he likes it. I'll make so much money. And I'll be so happy. And he comes in. He's like, yeah, I don't like it. Looks like two paintings. It's two paintings. You try to put it in one. And he's talking on the phone to somebody. Like, All right, let's go. I'm out of here. And I was, like, devastated and crushed. I was like, oh, man, 10 months of my life down the drain. But of course, like, you know, that's totally the wrong way to look at it because it's not about this one dude who has money or whatever. Like, that's, that's, that's meaningless, you know? Um, and, and you have to be, like, prepared for that, too, that, like, nobody needs you to make art. The world will be fine without you being an artist. It doesn't care what you do. Um, and so as time goes on, there's this lesson of humility that you have to learn. It's really a weird place to be because at the same time, you have to be really like, you know, satisfied with your, well, clever little me, I made this painting, aren't I cool? But then you also have to, um, you don't have to do anything, but you, you will at some point experience failure and you can't let it destroy you. So you have to be like, all right, well, Mr. Producer didn't get it, you know, okay, so what? I mean, I'm still going to keep making this stuff, you know? And that's really like a lesson, probably not just even about painting, it's, it's about like life in general. Um, that you just got to keep doing it. Um, this one I had taken a lot of photographs back when I was in college. Actually, I'm not, <laughs> so it was, I forgot to mention also did, was doing all, I do all kinds of stuff. So one of the things that I do is photography and in college I'd been doing more photographs and then I had, had all my friends come over at some point and pose naked covered with clay and I took all these photos. So they exist as photographs but then I had them laying around one day and I said, well, I should make a painting with all those. And so I did. So then that's what this painting is. I don't know how it fits into the rest of them. I guess maybe it's just about like, you know, what we do as human beings. It seems like we're kind of loving and like love and war all kind of like a part of the same tapestry of, of human experience. Okay, then I changed styles again because I moved, I think, to a different studio. It only seems like when I moved to a studio, it changes the style. And these became maybe more, they started to become like faces. And probably it was like, you know, I would do this stuff and then put an eye in it. And um, there's no eye in this one. There's an eye in this one. And so the eye then started to become a face after a while. Um, and this is probably the period where it seems like the most surrealist, you know, like Dali. Um, and, and again, I can't really tell you what this is about. I mean, it seems to be self-evident. It's like some, it's a crazy looking eye, looking at a headless person who's not too happy. So I don't know. When you put an eye in something, I notice too that like all of a sudden it becomes like you, you can relate to it. Like it's not just a random bunch of stuff. It's like a random bunch of stuff with an eye. And so there, therefore like, oh, that's a, it's a pareidolia, you know, when people see the face of Jesus in a toast or something like that. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You know? Um, so 
I think this would this had been a period. This was a, a one of the periods where um, nobody was paying attention to my work, and so I remember sitting a lot in in that in a studio, just making the stuff anyways. Um, Sometimes I don't know what to say. Sometimes I feel like I'm just like babbling when probably the thing is to just let the image talk for itself. Um, but um, I think maybe one of the things that I was going to mention that has something to do with the workshop that I'll be doing tomorrow is the materiality of painting is something that can't be overstated. And it's, it's something that I tell my students too, because it's when you start making an oil painting or you start doing anything, and you get all your materials set up and you're getting ready to go, you're act when you open the paint and put it down there, you're activating like a chemical reaction or an alch alchemical reaction that you can't walk away from, because it's gonna something's gonna occur. If you leave your brushes, they're gonna get destroyed. So you can't then go in Facebook and you can't go. It's like when you're well, I find this to be more true when I'm editing a video, my attention is more divided. Because that form of art that's coming off of the screen is, it's sort of like, it's ephemeral, it's more evanescent, there's no tangible thing that's there. But a painting very much is there, you know? And so I do believe in the objectness of painting. I don't think that the object, there's this idea in art theory that the object is over and there's no more thing as aura, and I don't believe any of that. I think that the, the object still has a magical quality to it. And that's one of the things that's counter to the digital world that we live in, which is so virtuous, so unreal. You know, it's like you're familiar with it, I'm sure. You know, like you can invent a whole persona on the Facebook, you know, or you can, um, anytime you're having an experience, you have to be like photographing it to prove that it occurred. So there's this weird thing that's happened to us in this day and age. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm not saying it's good, but I think that what painting does and why it's relevant, it should always be relevant, um, because you know, in a, in a certain way, it's like no, we don't really, nobody knows who any famous painters are. You certainly know, you know who's doing music and this and that, but I really doubt that I could go up to the average person on the street and get them to name like three contemporary painters. You know, it's, it would be hard to do, or artists for that matter. But we do this crap anyways. Like we, you know, and I believe that it's important to do. I mean, it, to me, it's a type of like it's it's a it's just like a way of living. You know, it's like um, a way of making your life poetic, I suppose, instead of boring. Um, what else are you gonna do? Like, I hate I don't watch TV. I don't even have a TV. I have a TV, but I don't have it hooked up to anything. And um, I'd much rather just like create something than have something be created for me. Not that I don't enjoy stuff, you know, but I think maybe like if we're gonna, well, I'm not saying if we're doing anything, but it's, it's, all I can tell you is what works for me and what works for me, how I can get out of all the insanity is to go to the studio and to be involved with the creative process because you'll enter a zone where you don't care about anything else. You can't even think about it, all that stuff that's bothering you because you're in the moment of making something, and um, in that moment, it's just you become absorbed with creating the thing. Um, and so it's just a really nice break from having to worry about all that other stuff. Um, since Instagram was invented, I'm in this weird thing now where after I do something, I'm like, oh shit, I better Instagram that. <laughs> And I have to resist that, you know, like I have to say, no, don't bring, you know, don't bring the, the gamblers into the temple or whatever, you know, like don't take this thing that's sacred and, and let that world encroach on it. Um, so here, uh, here's another studio. I'm, I told you I could talk forever. I'm not even really at like where I should be at this point. Um, this was another studio I had in Los Angeles. And so another um, change in uh, style. And I guess I'm just going through some images of uh, the type of paint I use. I like to use Gamblin and Sennelier. You've got to have a lot of brushes when you do oil paint. At one point, my studio was completely red. It was kind of living in a uterus or something like that. I had cats, a lot of cats that I don't have anymore. They're fine. It's not like they've been killed or my sister took them. 
Um, they don't, cats and oil paint don't mix well. You'll find. So these are just some process shots to give you an idea of what kind of they look like when they're being made. Um, and I really loved, I loved this studio. I loved being in this little world that was just so not the ordinary. It would kind of like I would enter this door and go in here and listen to my music and just do my thing and um, for hours. It was great. This was a painting that I spent a lot of time on that never became anything. And so that's another lesson, too, that sometimes that's going to happen. You know, you can go out with that guy for two years and realize it was a total waste of time, right? Anybody have, has that happened to anybody? Yeah. Uh, here they are exhibited, and it just gives you a sense of the size, maybe. Um, and it's, you know, it's one thing to see the, the image projected, but I really think the image has to be seen in person um, to really be seen. So those are part of this different series. In this series, I started to become more figurative. So the work became more about human beings and less about this surrealistic landscape. It's still creepy. Um, it's still about a lot of the same stuff, like what is it, what is it a ma you know, the masks that we wear as human beings, or this idea of a person. And as it became figurative, you know, I found myself painting women more than men. Um, and I didn't ask myself why. Well, why is that all right if you do that? I just, it's just something that occurred. And um, I, didn't really qu I didn't really question it. You know, it just kind of became the thing that I did or wanted to do. Um, and so then I had to find models. I remember this, I photographed this girl who was working at a Chinese food restaurant. And she's really excited about being in a painting. And then I did the painting, and then I showed her. <laughs> she, she wasn't so excited about the painting. She's <laughs> like, because her eyes are missing. Now, sometimes, I, you know, so it's, it's kind of like in the early stages when I was doing figurative stuff, it, like half of it would be like the people that I would photograph, and then half of it would be just images that I'd find in a magazine, and the other part would be just like stuff that I, you know, made up out of my head. So obviously a lot of this stuff here is from, you know, like a magazine, and I didn't get this person to pose for me in bondage or whatever, like that didn't occur. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to paint anyways. <laughs> And this is kind of one of the, this is sort of like one person in the middle and then the other is real and the other people are made up. And it's, these two works are for me about the, the title I gave it was the Moire, which are the three fates. And so maybe it's, I mean, maybe it's that, maybe it's not, but it's, I wanted to make work with all of these. The question is like, well, who's looking at the paint? You're looking at the painting, but the painting's also looking at you. So the eye contact was really important that I wanted the painting to be like not passive but active, that the idea of looking was always in it. That was something that, that came out of that interest with the eye. And so a lot of times they have this you know, sideways glance at you. Or maybe the painting's looking at itself. You know, one part of the painting is looking at another part of the painting. So that's, that's something that I was excited about. I never finished this one, but I kind of like threw it in there anyway. Um, that was the end of that series. I think now we're in Florida. I got burned out in California. I just kind of was like, at a certain point, I was, I was up for a tenure track job. A lot of people, if you go to college, you probably don't realize most of your professors are what are called adjuncts. Anybody know that? Did you know that? So only like 30% have are full time, which means they have like assurance of a job and they have health care and such and such and so forth. So I had been an adjunct for so long and I was like, you know, forget it. Like I just, I need a full time job. The, pay, the art money isn't what it used to be. Is after the crash of the 2008 and everything. And um, I hated driving around all that. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to go and look for a full-time job. And I looked for a little while, and I found two pretty quickly. One here at Palm Beach State College. And the other one was in um, Edinburgh University at the, in Erie, Pennsylvania. And even though it was more money and more prestigious, because it was part of the UPenn system, I see somebody shaking their head. Uh, I didn't want to live, you know, in the snow shadow of the Lake Erie. Uh, I hate winter. And so I came here and started teaching here. And actually, I think it was a really good move. I really, as much as everybody here complains about South Florida, and they always, my students always ask me, they're like, why did you move from L.A.? L.A. is so awesome. I'm like, go live there and find out for yourself what it's really like. Go do it. You know, that's a, this city's tough. 
you know, it'll chew you up. If you've got a lot of money, it's, you don't have any worries. But if you're, if you're an artist, it's tough. Um, so the work that I've done in Florida, I think, is, mu is less, it's, it's like, it's happier, maybe. I mean, it's not as dark. And it's probably the most accomplished in terms of me as a painter as well. And it's the most figurative. And, and again, it's, it's about, I think it's about like, there's nothing really, I don't want to say that it's spiritual or there's spirits or something, but there's like this, I don't, the divine feminine, if you want to use some kind of Wiccan term or something like that, which we certainly don't have to, but like the painting, I mean, I wanted to create a painting that was like a person, you know, like that it wasn't like a particular person, like, oh, there's a painting of Cindy, but it was a painting that had this feeling, uh, and then I wanted to make them so worked over that when you were in the painting, you in front of it, you felt like it was like you're hanging out with somebody, you know? Um, and so, I don't know, I tried to do that. I, just, I guess they just tried to make paintings, and this is sort of what um, occurred. Um, and bringing color back. The work previously had just been so dark and dingy and it's like, you know, when all those French painters go to the Mediterranean and the, you know, Matisse and Nice and the other colors comes back into the thing. And um, so it's really exploring color. But there's always a, a lot of times there's an ominous quality to it as well. And so I like that, you know, the tension um, between the two. Um, and they have names and everything too. And, you know, they're, they're sort of vaguely mythological. But I don't think you need to really know any of that necessarily. This one was so hard to do, like technically, it's a very large piece, and I just spent hours trying to get it right. But they all, I mean, they're all very hard technically. It's a really difficult process, technical process. Um, takes a lot of time, especially blue. Blue in oil paint is the hardest thing ever I learned after making this work. Ultramarine blue is hell. Um, hopefully, it's worth it. I like how vivid this projector is. And it was about this time, too, that I started thinking about making films as well. Um, and so we're pretty much at the end of, we're almost just about up to the present time. This is the last finished painting that I've done, although I don't consider it finished because I don't like it. Um, I want to change it. But uh, I'm working on stuff now. So I want to talk, a, hopefully I have enough time to talk a little bit about the filmmaking that I've been doing. But I wanted to show you kind of a few process shots about how it, you can see how it kind of develops over many, 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 many days. Um, and not, I don't think it's really, it's going to sound weird this, that I say this. I don't really think it's hard. Like, I don't necessarily think I'm Mr. Talent or whatever. But the thing that separates somebody that's going to make a painting like this and somebody that's not is just some, there's going to be, you're going to be the one that puts in the time and the other person isn't. And just because it just takes so much time. And that's really it. If you work long enough with oil paint, you can make some really fantastic things. But you're not going to you know, make something that looks like this in one day. It's going to take a month or two. OK, with? So these are all just process shots. This is some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow if you come to the workshop, how to uh, do all this. So I'll just kind of run through it. Um, there's, you know, I've been hinting at this whole um, other thing, um, and I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go quickly through that because that can be more subjective tomorrow. Um, there's the book that I have out if you want to buy one. They're online. Um, you can check it out. Uh, there's the cover model, and here's some drawings. Blah blah blah. Um, I do want to talk a little. This is the stuff I'm doing right now. So this is my studio currently. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff that I've been doing since I came to, uh, to Florida. And, um, and have had time, as, because it, I remember I'm a full-time professor now. And when you're, when you're an adjunct, you're really living a harder life. And it, it really is true. And it's, ter and if, it's terrible that our educational system is taking advantage of these people. And I'm definitely. Um, I believe that you know that it's a situation that it shouldn't exist. But anyways, I'm lucky now that I have time to do stuff like you know make try and make films. So, um, 
You heard just some, I'm just going to go quickly through some of this stuff because um, this is just a show. Because I, I realize I'm running out of time. This was a show we had at Palm Beach State College with a lot of the work. Um, but what I want to get into, and then here's like a mural I made with one of my classes. But I want to talk a little bit about um, filmmaking and making videos. Um, I had this sort of inspiration at some point. I'd always been a photographer, but I, but I had this inspiration. Now that DSLR filmmaking is a reality, you can actually make really quality stuff with not hardly any money. That doesn't mean anything's going to happen to it, uh, and it's going to go anywhere. But this sort of led, all the, a lot of these experiments led to, m to me making last summer, I made a 70-minute film. Which was kind of, I was just like, all of a sudden, I was felt like making a film. I was like, well, hell yeah, I got the summer off. I'm going to make a film. And I did. Um, and I did, again, it's just like with the art. I didn't ask permission. I didn't know how to do it. I just did it. Um, and I, th I think in a way, a lot of the stuff was already there. It just had to, it wanted to come out. You know, and there needed to be a medium in which it um, could come out. And so I'll show, I'll show you like the trailer to that in a minute. And I'll show you the music, one of the music videos that I've done also. And so this has been sort of the last year. One of the reasons I've been painting so much is because I've been playing with filmmaking as a different thing. Um, and I see it as part of the same me. You know, it's just a, a, I'm playing with a different media. And it was an experiment. Looking back on this particular experiment, I have to tell you that filmmaking is very fun as a process. But then once you have the product, it's, it's really depressing. Because nobody will even watch a DVD. If you if one third of the people that I gave a freaking DVD to would even watch it, I'm thinking to myself, how many of your friends have made a feature-length film in the last year? But it's a dedicate. You have to dedicate 70 minutes of your life to like watching this thing. So it's like if you had a friend who was a novelist and said, "Hey, dude, read my 350-page book," you know, you'd be like, um, "Okay." Um, so. You know, maybe that's part of it too. Is like when you make a painting, like boom, there it is. Nobody really needs to do much except look at it. But with this type of medium, then I realized too that there's like there is no such thing really as independent film. I thought there would be, but there's not. And so that, uh, there's been a lot of difficulty as far as like taking, trying to take it to the public. And it finally got shown in Lake Worth, but all the other film festivals I submitted it to really weren't interested. Um, and at this point, I don't have any money, and I don't really care. So it's probably it's going to end up on Amazon Instant View at some point. You can watch it. Um, but I I enjoyed it. I want to do stuff again. I have screenplays for other things, and then that also led to me making um, a music video for a couple of music, like a lot of music videos for a local band. And maybe I'll show a couple of those things really quickly, and then probably you'll be sick of me by then um, if you're not already. And we can ask questions. I, I think probably it's best not to uh, overdo it. OK, so this is a trailer. Hopefully this works. This is a trailer for the movie. It's called Sanctum and Sacrum. It's great. It's, I'm very proud that once, if, after you watch this movie, I don't know if we have sound. Is the sound hooked up to this? Yeah. You'll have no idea at all what the movie is about. I hope this sound works. Okay, it's not. Where is that going to be? Right here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Aim an image of the film. It's better sound quality than that. I am a viper's fang. I am time. Become old. I am an endless water that no wind will make dry. Why would a goddess suffer the tears of a boy? Would you seek to strike to the mask? Would you dare?
Go back to bed, little boy. Mommy's busy right now. So the movie is about uh, two couples that inhabit the same apartment and uh, live in parallel universes, and then sort of they, the the whole thing inverts in this weird weird way. Um, I don't know. I like the movie. Um, I'll show a little bit of this video, but not a lot of it. This uh, is for a band out of West Palm Beach called The Band in Heaven. And um, I just became friends with them and started talking about it. And we made this video. It took a long time to do. We put a lot of work in it. But it paid off because when it premiered, it premiered on Spin uh, Magazine. And it got, you know, like 11,000 hits the first day or something like that. You know, I don't know. But, it, you know, we're really happy with it. Um, I'll just kind of skip through it because I don't want to keep you for five minutes. That's online if you want to uh, check that out, too. And another thing that I've recently done is I've opened an uh, uh, art gallery project space in Lake Worth called uh, Unit One. If you go to my personal website, you can check that out. And so I've been curating shows now, too. And I think all this, all this stuff, like I'm going to go back to painting, but um, I think art is like a social media. And to have the opportunity to, to do other things, like I didn't, I never just like wanted to be, oh, I'm just only going to paint. Um, and so now, I'm going to go back to painting, but always with the intention of, you know, trying these things out on the side because they're they're fun. Opening an art gallery or doing a music video or, or whatever. Um, and ultimately, I think that if like if we're going to close on a thought, I mean, I know I've been talking to you for a while. It's like that's why you should, that's why I make art, and that's why I think anybody should make art. Not because you're going to make a lot of money, because you probably won't. You might make, make a little bit. You might make a lot, but probably won't. Um, you should make art, and you should do these things because like it's fun to do. Um, and like it's its own reward. Like it's fun to make a movie, even if it like never becomes big. It's fun to make a music video. It's fun to make a painting, and it's better than watching television. Um, and so I know with great certainty, if, if however, if I get to live another whatever thirty years, that this is the kind of stuff that I want to fill my life with, because it's meaningful. Um, and I think that all of you, whatever you do, whether, whether you do painting or, or when you think about your life, you don't, maybe you don't think of yourself as having a talent or something, but you can live your life in a creative way. It can be an art form. And that's really, I think, one of the tricks of, of ha like getting through all the crap in our, in our modern day world is thinking about things in a, like a poetic way. Um, and whether that's with painting or whether that's just with some, some kind of way that you approach the world, I think that's what, um, as an ambassador for the arts, that's what I would want to communicate to you is just to do it. And again, not because like you're gonna become famous or get money or anything, but just because like that's what you should do. Um, so thank you again for listening to me talk and looking at my work. It's really, a, it's a pleasure and privilege to have an audience. And um, so yeah, go ahead and turn the lights on. So if anybody has any questions or anything, I'd be happy to ask or answer, try and answer them if you, if you had any questions. Yes? In your process, do you ever, uh, I know that you like to go head first, but do you ever plan what you might want to do? Do you, do you do sketching beforehand? 
Yeah, I mean, actually do a lot of uh, preparation. And so they're not, I don't want you to think that they're just, oh, whatever just comes, comes. It's, there is a lot of, there is a lot of sort of like I do, you know, computer sketches or I do sketch sketches. And so there, there is a whole methodology of planning that goes into it. But a lot of it too is kind of of the moment and let's just see what happens. It's a combination of the two. It's kind of hard to explain, I don't know. Any other? Yeah, Lisa? How, how do you <laughs> <laughs> Jackson Pollock, didn't Jackson Pollock answer that in the Jackson Pollock movie? He's like, how do you know when you're done making love? Isn't that what he said? Um, I don't know, it's when I, when I, like I exhibited a painted recently, painting recently that I didn't consider finished and everybody's like, what are you talking about? It's done. I'm like, no, it's not done. There's still stuff I, I have to do with it. And um, so the answer to that question is just like, you just know. <laughs> Are there questions? Yeah. Um, when you said that you were um, having trouble with the blue paper, did you mean? Well, ultra, have you worked with ultramarine, ultramarine blue before? It's simultaneously runny and thick. And so when you build it up into a glaze, it's really hard to control. It's one of probably the hardest paint, in my opinion, to control. Whereas something like um, you know, a transparent red oxide or something is really easy. And if you don't know, if you have an oil paint, I think it's kind of hard to describe that. Yeah, have your attention, please. The library now research that over closing in 15 minutes. So using computers, I encourage to complete their work because that stream minutes as computers and lecture should come to an end. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. That's a good question. I try and keep the painting as painting. You know, there's digital sources, you know, and I plan, I'll do digital sketches, but then the painting is just paint. It's just a panel and paint. I don't like to mix it up that way. No, no. That's a good question. That's all just painting, sort of pure on that sense. Yeah. I use a grid. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll have like, you know, a printout of it, and then I'll use a grid and I'll trace the image. Um, and then in the workshop tomorrow, if you come to it, I'm going to walk everybody. I have a painting that I have in six different phases of completion, and I'm going to walk whoever comes to that, I'm going to walk you through it. And it's kind of because oil. Do, Describing oil painting is so hard because it's like in a cooking show when they're like, and then you put it in the oven for 45 minutes and then they have one that's already ready. So that was the solution I came up with is to have the thing in six different versions of completion. So I'd like, in the first stage, this is what you do. And then the second stage, and you'll see that the, the whole thing is about layering, like layer and intentionality, I think. And the more and more time you spend with it, like the more it becomes the thing that wants to be, and they don't, like I said before, the only trick is that you just keep doing it and that you just don't give up. So if you have a short attention span and you never, you won't ever happen to, to that level. Now, not everybody that paints in oil has to do super realistic stuff. I mean, you could, there's many styles, you know, but it's just this particular one that I've sort of gone into requires that and I like the effect that it has. And so it's kind of hard to go back, you know, after going to that place. But, all the technical stuff I'm going to explain tomorrow if you come to the workshop, which is at 2 o'clock. Yeah, it's in the ceramic studio class right here, 2 o'clock tomorrow, free workshop. And it's free. How many, you know, what, like, not a lot of, that's the thing, too, is not a lot of people these days know really how to do realistic figurative oil painting. Um, it's sort of like a niche thing, you know. Um, so I would have really loved sitting in on that, something like that when I was younger, if I was a painter, because I kind of had to figure all this stuff out myself over a long period of time. Um, even though, the, of course, you know, you learn a little bit in art school, but art, art school, <laughs> I know this is being recorded. Um, art school isn't really necessarily about technique, unfortunately. It, it, some are, some are, uh, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them really are more about like placement, quote unquote. It's hard to get if you've never been there, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Well, there, that's another interesting question. Um, you know, like, 
and, and people always ask, people will ask that, and, it, and I guess it's like it's an innocent question. Um, I don't really like to answer it, um, just because I think that, like I, like I just said before, he said, what's the most I've ever sold a painting for? Because I think it's sort of, it's, it's missing the point. I mean, it's nothing against you, and it's fine to ask the question, but like, it sort of doesn't matter, you know? Um, and I could tell you one number, and you'd be like, oh. And I could tell you another number, and you'd be like, oh. You know, and, but it's still the same painting, right? I mean, you should be the one who, who judges it, not, you shouldn't judge it based on like, oh, well, that sold for that amount of money, therefore, it's awesome. You know, because I'll tell you, there's some paintings that go for a lot of money, and then my opinion, suck. So, sorry, I'm being evasive on that one. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's some great stuff that's $10 million. And that's when you, that's the strange thing about art is like, you, you can't let money be the signifier because all it'll do is get you upset, you know. You'd be like, man, fuck that. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's the fucked up thing about the art world. I'm sorry. Like, that's, it is frustrating. I mean, it's like so frustrating when you get in there into the art world. Do you, and like I said earlier, I thought there, wouldn't gonna, there wasn't going to be any rules, but I discovered there are all these weird random rules and other stuff that like nobody can really quite figure out. Like, why is this worth that? And there's no easy answer to that question, and there's just no easy way to, you know, explain it to you. I'm still, and so probably the only thing I could recommend to you is just to ignore it. Because um, if you pay attention to it, it'll like destroy you. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. Now, I figured out a way to answer this question. I completely agree with, he's, with what you're saying, and you're, you're right on in your approach. When, when like, um, the banking system was started in Holland, and the, 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 one of the first, spec, we know what, about the housing bubble. One of the first speculative bubbles was called the tulip bubble. Has anybody heard of this? So they started trading in tulip uh, futures when the, 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 the Dutch bank opened up. And so what, a tulip bulbs, and it's a flower, it's a type of flower. And it's like, should be worth like, you know, a couple bucks or something like that. But then there were some exotic strains that people got into, and all of a sudden there was this craze, a speculative craze, to where tulip bulbs started rising in value, and you knew that they would be. So people would buy a tulip bulb one week for 10 bucks and flip it for 20. And then that person would, that bought it for 20 bucks would flip it for 80 until you had like the most expensive tulip bulb going for $15,000. And this is a stupid flower, like bulb for flower. And then, you know, overnight, people were like, what the hell are we doing? These are just stupid tulip bulbs. And the, they all dropped in value. And in the meantime, there's this sailor that came, this is only taking place in one year. The sailor came back from Indochina or whatever. And he went into a restaurant to have a sandwich and he wanted some onions on a sandwich and he saw this thing that he thought was an onion was actually a tulip um, over on the table and he cut it up and put it in his sandwich and ate it. And the shopkeeper came back and says, where's, like, where's my $5,000 tulip bulb? And he's like, you're what? <laughs> so they took that guy and put him in prison for eating a $5,000 tulip that he thought was like you know, an onion. So that's the stupidity of it all. Like, like why is something worth what it's worth? Just because like, some people thought it would, was. And then they were like, oh crap, we better get on that train. you know. So it's, it's stupid to think, I mean, it's, mean, like, it's meaningless, you know? Like, there's great art out there that's worth a lot of money, and there's crappy art out there that's worth a lot of money.